All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Today is Monday, April 25th, 12.30 p.m. section. Recording is on. <clears throat> so in just a few minutes, we're gonna be talking about uh, the solution for homework 10. But before we do, I wanted to also uh, kind of talk about some end of semester logistics and remind team six that we are meeting after class. So none of your members should leave, right? So <clears throat> with that, uh, we are approaching the end of the semester. And as part of that, just wanted to kind of talk about a few things on the assignments. So the first and most important is that uh, today we're gonna cover homework 10. Uh, individual homework 11 will be due on Monday, May 2nd, one week from today, final individual homework of the semester. And also on Monday, May 2nd, you'll be doing group case four, which is on the group project for multiples here. And the company that's been assigned uh, as the, uh, to, to do this on is Nokia. And we will be talking about that assignment here in just a few minutes, okay? So basically uh, Wednesday, Again, we're pretty much done with all the content this semester. I, I have no more content to lecture you on or assignments to assign you from the book. So essentially uh, on Wednesday, uh, we're not gonna have a live lecture. I'm gonna give you class time to work on your final group case, which is that is due one week from today. Then after you present the final group case next Monday, uh, also next week, you'll finish up your Bloomberg Trading Challenge. So that ends next week. And Wednesday, May 4th, will be an in-class extra credit. Okay? So since all the assignments will be done, I will do one final extra credit for the semester. It'll be in class on Monday, May 4th. So if you're interested in extra credit, that is your extra credit opportunity. The other extra credit opportunity, essentially down here, which is the assignment replacement, okay? So essentially this is a 500 word paper that you can write anytime this semester up until next Monday and submit on CVS. And if you do the assignment replacement, what it will replace is potentially any one of these individual homework assignments, including the Bloomberg certification and or the individual midterm exam. So the assignment replacement does not replace a group project, okay? But if you do it and it replaces one of these, basically what we'll do is we will take the assignment with the lowest amount of points that you earned and the highest potential point value and basically give you full credit as if you did the assignment and you also didn't miss it. So for example, let's say for some reason you just didn't turn in homework eight. You lost 5% of your semester grade and you can't opt out of the final exam. So if you do the assignment replacement, we'll treat homework eight as if you did it, you get all five points and it won't count against you for opting out because you've replaced that assignment, okay? So again, you don't have to tell us which assignment replacement you wanna replace. The TAs will apply that criteria next week, okay? So <clears throat> once they apply that criteria, all the grades are gonna be in by Wednesday, May 4th. They have to be, okay? So that on Thursday, May 5th, or the latest Friday morning, May 6th, we'll tell you whether you're opting out of the final exam. If we determine that you're opt-out eligible, then the TAs will put 10 points in here while it says final exam opt-out points. So this will say 10, and then you're done. You don't have to take the final exam. So Wednesday, May 4th will be your last day of class. If, however, you don't opt out of the final exam, you have a zero here, then you'll take the final exam in class on Monday, May 9th for up to 10 points. Okay. So just a few upcoming end of semester logistics. Questions about any of that? All right, well, if no questions, well, let's start talking about the solution for homework 10. 
Uh, somebody says, how does the extra credit work? Does it just add overall points? Yes, it does. So we started the semester with 100 total points. I've put in at least two points of extra credit already. And that final assignment will be another one to two points. So essentially by the end of next Wednesday, there'll be 103 to 104 points this semester of which you're trying to accumulate 100 towards a grade, okay? So it's not percent of total, it is just total percentage or total points you achieve across all assignments determine your grade. Now, extra credit does not help you when it comes to final exam opt-out. That would be assignment replacement. Okay. And again, for the assignment replacement, you cannot use that for a team project. <clears throat> so team projects don't count. And team projects also don't count against your opt-out of the final exam unless you are peer-reviewed to not participate in the team project in which case you will not be able to opt out of the final exam. Also, if you're sent to the honor council, you're not able to opt out of the final exam. Okay. But again, we will apply the opt outs and let you know who's able to opt out next week. All right, let's talk about homework time. So I'm gonna share my desktop just to make it easier to jump back and forth. So as a reminder, homework 10, was the multiple analysis on Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, right? And I did the solution with the 8 a.m. section this morning uh, before the market opened. So let me pull up the solution. Okay. So those are the three companies, PE, EV to sales, EV to EBIT multiples. Okay. So again, got the data from Bloomberg. So starting out with Lockheed Martin. What you should have done is you should have gone to the WAC, take a screenshot, cost of equity, WAC, enter the data. Cost of equity, WAC, enter the data. That didn't change. Then Raytheon, RTX, now, interestingly, this morning at 8 a.m., the cost of equity was not 10%, it was 9.9, .9, okay? It's another reason why we take screenshots. Even in the middle of the day, some of these numbers could change, okay? So I'm gonna leave 9.9 .9 in my solution just because I did the solution at, during the 8 a.m. section, but nonetheless, if I were doing it right now, cost of equity and whack, okay? And finally, same thing for Northrop Grumman, NOC, US equity. It's 6.1. .9, this morning, the WAC was 6.2, not 6.1. <clears throat> and the cost of equity is 6.9. So again, back to the dynamic nature of the changes of this data. I'm gonna still stick with the data for this morning to sync up with those multiples. But nonetheless, you show you where the data comes from. Next, we'd have gone to the EEO screen. <clears throat> and we had gone to the second forward year. Count the forward years, one, two. And then we'd have gotten the net income here, 4105 for Northrop Grumman. We'd have gotten the PE for the second forward year. The EV to revenue, which is EV to sales, and the EV to EBIT. And we would have put in PE, EV to sales, EV to EBIT, and repeated this process for Raytheon, grabbing their net income in the second forward year, PE, EV to sales, EV to EBIT, and Again, same for Lockheed Martin. So once we put all that data in, we then would have needed to estimate, so I got my PEs, got my return equity, cost of equity, net income, 
we'd have needed operating ROIC and tax rate. Now for tax rate, we could have gone to GUID. All three companies had given guidance on their tax rate. This was Lockheed Martin's tax rate guidance, 16.9%. Okay, round it off to 17 here, 16.9 up there. Decimal place. Right, and again, tax rate guidance for Raytheon and Northrop Grumman. So we put in the tax rate guidance. <clears throat> Next, we need an ROIC. And the key of the ROICs is remember these are perpetuity ROICs and perpetuity ROEs. We also need the expected ROEs, right? So start back with Lockheed Martin, the EDO. What is a reasonable ROE, right? Well, again, on the EDO, we either scroll down or minimize, and there's the forecast for ROE. And we see for Lockheed Martin, 60s. Right, it's pretty consistent over the four years. So I chose 64%. Northrop Grumman. <clears throat> Again, a couple years, it's 59, don't look at that as the permanent, but a few years coming up, it's around 28. So using 28. I think that's representative perpetuity. Raytheon, a little bit of a different story. Raytheon, the expected return on equities are low, nine to twelve percent in the next few years. Well, that is going to be a problem from my cost of equity standpoint. Now, I already know that Raytheon's trading at a premium to Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, it's right here, right. And I know that their cost of capital is much higher. Well, the only way that they're going to trade at a premium if their cost of capital is much higher is to have a better growth spread combination. Okay. So the problem with these return and equities is that they aren't going to really solve for a G that basically gets me to the multiple that I'm trying to do. Okay, same is true if we go to the RV screen. Like when I go to Lockheed Martin's RV screen and I'm trying to estimate the operating ROIC and assess whether today's operating ROIC is representative of the perpetuity operating ROIC, what I can tell you is when I look at the data for op op Lockheed Martin, okay, makes sense. Right, the return on equities stay pretty high in the 60% range. <clears throat> They're 32% ROIC today. I expect Lockheed Martin to do well and to continue to do well. And I don't think 32% is out of bounds. So I'll use 32% for Lockheed Martin's ROIC. For Northrop Grumman, same thing. 16% ROIC, low 20s, low to mid 20s for ROE, pretty consistent all the years. So I'm gonna assume 16% is reasonable. For Raytheon, the last year's ROIC was 5.79%. So I'm telling you, if you put in 5.79% for ROIC against an eight and a half percent WAC, and you try and solve for a G right here, that makes that multiple work, you're going to get a crazy number. Okay. In fact, I'll, I'll try and do that. I'll put in 5.79 negative spread. I'm going to need a very big negative G. And I can see here if I go to data, what if goal seek? Because if I set this to 18 by solving for G, <clears throat> I'm gonna get some crazy negative G, which doesn't make any sense, <clears throat> which is why I continue to mention that you can't plug and chug these solutions. You're gonna to have to use a sort of an analytical approach and, and try and make, make sense on what you see. 
And so for Raytheon, like the current spread is not indicative of the future. And as we look at Raytheon, we'll get a sense as to why. Two things are going on. Number one, they just merged with United Technologies two years ago. So they spent a huge amount of money on a merger and they still haven't reaped all the benefits of the merger. That's hurting their ROIC. Number two, half of Raytheon's business is commercial. They are the biggest supplier to the airline industry and to 737 MAX in particular, which had a lot of trouble. So therefore, <clears throat> Raytheon, which is still dealing with problems of the pandemic when it comes to the airlines, is not fully recovered. That's half their business. So when you kind of think about Raytheon from a valuation standpoint, this 5.79% is clearly now what the market thinks they're going to do going forward. And the multiple is actually giving you some insight into that. So what we have to do is we have to come up with a more reasonable growth ROIC combination for Raytheon before we can do this analysis. I want to pause there to see if there's any questions or comments about any of that. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, like I did, I did this. So were you, were you, were you uh, like, uh, when you agree this, you will uh, read that like, that mark wrong for this or not? Yeah, if you put, if you have a G of like a big negative number, that can't be correct. And I'm just saying, even if you looked at Raytheon, switch this to Raytheon, and you looked at the EEO that you're going to turn as a screenshot, like their revenue is going from 64 billion to 85 billion. Their profits going from $4 a share to 7.30 a share. Their income's going from seven to 14 billion. That's not a negative G by any sense of the imagination. So reconciling that Raytheon's gonna have a giant negative G in the future, like given everything that you see and, and look in front of you, that one's gonna be a lot harder to justify. So even the numbers that you're seeing are, are giving you a sense that something's kind of being challenging with this data from yesterday as terms of what the market has to be looking at tomorrow, especially if they're trading at a big multiple, bigger than, higher than the multiples of their peers. So they were giving you a lot of clues in the multiples that they can't possibly have this giant negative G. So yes, if you put in a big negative G, then that's a miss. What if we, um we had a negative G, but in the write-up, we kind of explained that we believe that it was actually a positive um, growth. So you're, you're saying that you have a negative G, but there would be positive growth? Well, because let's just say that we couldn't get the G in the model to, like, work. Yes. But we, but we understood the fact that, like, there was a positive growth, and we kind of explained why we thought that in the write-up. So I will say, I'll leave it up to the discretion of the TAs about how much partial credit, but taking outside the answer of credit for the assignment, at least you're starting to directly see what we're talking about in the class. So I'll recognize that that's better from a critical thinking standpoint than just what I'll call plug and chug and then just saying, well, the answer is the answer and I'm just gonna stick with that. So, cause the point is what you're inferring is what I'm saying here is that there actually has to be more growth <clears throat> To, to explain this multiple of 18. And the spread can't be this negative spread. It's gonna to have to turn positive. So the question is how much more positive and how much more of a growth can you have? So here's the point. Let's just say that we know that the defense and aerospace industry, because we've done our EIC, you know, generally the, the government spends two to 4% on defense, depending on where we stand with the threats of the world for the US. And these companies tend to go up and down with the economy, kind of like the uh, the market, uh, you know, S and P, and somewhat tied to defense spending. So long term, you know, we're already seeing Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman are one to three percent, right? And we know that Raytheon not only is tied to the U.S. government for defense, it's got a commercial business, planes. Long term, planes are going to grow. So even if we put in three percent for a G, and I don't recommend this, but you can basically put in for your final solution, but I can put in a G and solve for an ROIC. And the point is, if I put in a pretty high G, I'm still gonna need a pretty high ROIC 
if I do a solver on the ROIC to get to an 18 times multiple. So all the data is kind of pointing me to say, look, long-term the market expects a little bit higher growth, a little bit of higher, higher ROIC in order to get to these multiples. And remember that they have a higher cost of capital. So I already know that they're gonna to have to discount those cash flows at a higher rate and still end up with a higher multiple, which suggests more cash flow, higher growth, higher spread. So I can't use the current situation to represent the future. So where do I come up with a future? Well, a couple of ideas here. One is, one is I kind of know that the margins of Raytheon and Lockheed Martin are pretty similar. In fact, Lockheed Martin's pre-tax margin is a little bit lower than Raytheon's pre-tax margin in perpetuity. Lockheed Martin just happens to have a lower tax rate for the after-tax margin. But the point is, I know their margins are going to be higher. I also know when you get to a high ROIC and a high ROE, what that practically means is you don't have a lot of reinvestment. That's the reason why these companies can pay out so much, because there's really not much of a difference between a 50% ROIC and a 40% ROIC when it comes to valuation, right? Because at that point, you have such little reinvestment that the real driver of your free cash flow is the gross cash flow, not the gross investment. So translation, these companies are not reinvesting a lot. And at the same time, they have high margins, which are driving their ROIC in the first place. So back to if Raytheon long-term is gonna have similar margins to Lockheed Martin long-term, then they're probably gonna have similar ROICs in the long-term. So basically, I think the way the market is trading Raytheon, is not with an expected ROIC of 5.79, the number I'm using in my solution is 30. Now you could probably make an argument that it's higher than 32 based on this operating margin, but somewhere between 25 and 35% is probably a more reasonable number for a range of ROICs that you would use for Raytheon. And I use 30 with the idea that on an after-tax basis, it's a little bit lower margin Lockheed Martin for a similar level of productivity, and a higher cost of capital. How do I explain a G? And when I solve for that G, with a 30% ROIC by setting this to 18 times EBIT by changing the growth, my growth solves for about 4.89%. So somewhere closer to 5% G and mid 20s to low 30s ROIC is probably where the market believes Raytheon is going in order to trade them in an 18 times multiple. And that's again, back to the point, because they're trading at a high multiple, I know they can't have a negative spread. And I know from what I looked at the industry that they're not expected to have a big negative G in the long term. Unlike Nokia. Nokia, I knew enough about the industry to know that Nokia was challenged in that industry in the transition that it is making to the cloud. Raytheon doesn't have that. And so as a result, it's, it's a little bit less intuitive to say it's gonna have a big neg G, negative G. So back to the question you were asking, like the fact that you said, no, I, I know they needed to grow. I think the market's saying the same thing. The market believes they're gonna grow. They're gonna come out of the pandemic. The commercial business is gonna recover, do well long-term. The defense business has been kind of slow and steady and predictable long-term. And so therefore with that, getting reasonable margins, giving reasonable ROIC in the future, I'm going to trade them at 18 times earnings. And that's what you're seeing for Raytheon. Again, pause, questions. Yeah, I have one question. Yep. So where'd you get that um, effective tax rate at 22.4% again? Uh, RTX guidance. Oh, got it, got it. It was the last guidance they gave for the tax rate. Mm -hmm. And since that's in 2020, would it be fine if 
because instead I think I looked up like the JP Morgan um, for like 18.6, I think it was, or something like that. Yeah, that'd be reasonable. And, yeah. and if you reference that, <clears throat> I will tell you that the tax rate is probably not going to be the most important thing when you explain the differences, but as long as you referenced the JP Morgan one and said that that's what they're using long-term, that's fine. Okay, sounds good. Uh, PEs, we also have to deal with the PE because if they make a 30% expected ROIC in perpetuity, their return on equity is not going to be in the teens. It's going to be higher. So here's the next assumption. If I look at Raytheon's sort of debt to equity ratio, they're 80% equity and 20% debt. Okay. So here's what I just did very simplistically. As so I said, okay, take the 30% ROIC divided by 0.8, and that gets me about a 37%, 37.5% ROE. So again, that's the other point, which is I have to adjust the ROE for Raytheon because I adjusted the ROIC for Raytheon. Once I've done that, I could then begin my analysis. And I already know that the discount rate is going to be a big part of this analysis because there's a large variation between Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. It's almost three points. 2.7 points. So that's going to play a role even before I do the, the discounts and premiums. So why is Lockheed Martin trading a discount to Raytheon? Well, I know Raytheon's got a much higher cost of equity, 9.9 versus 7.2. So that's not why Raytheon's PE is higher than Lockheed Martin's. So Lockheed Martin's trading at a discount because even though they have a bigger spread, 57 points versus let me call this well, off 10, 28 points. Lockheed Martin's expected to grow that much bigger spread at about 1% a year. Raytheon's expected to grow that pretty big, but smaller spread at almost 5% per year. And the 4.87G is why this is trading in a premium to that slightly lower spread. Now, they would actually trade at a bigger premium if they had the same cost of capital. PE would be almost 38, 37, but it's not. And the reason why it's, it's not 37 times earnings, it's only 17 times earnings, is because they have a higher cost of equity. So that cost of equity is definitely a, a headwind into Raytheon's price to earnings multiple. But they're overcoming that headwind because they have, even though they have a slightly lower spread, that's still a pretty big spread at 21 points. So 28 points and at a 5% G, 4.87% G versus about the 1% per year growth of Lockheed Martin. That's why Raytheon's trading at a premium. If I go to EV to EBIT, I'm gonna see a silver story. Again, if they have close to similar spreads, give Lockheed Martin a slightly better spread, right? 32 minus seven is about 25 points. Modified 30 minus eight and a half is about 21 points. So they have more spread at Lockheed Martin operationally, right? But the major difference is lower hurdle rate at Lockheed Martin of 6.9 versus 8.5 helps Lockheed Martin with the multiple. So how is Raytheon trading at an even higher multiple? It's the G, it's the 4.89. So it is clear that somewhere around this almost 5% G is what's driving Raytheon's multiples, both the PE as well as the EV to EBIT to be a premium to everybody or to Lockheed Martin on all the ratios. Even though Raytheon has a higher tax rate, 22.4 versus 16.9. We use the modified JP Morgan one of 19 versus 17. Higher tax rate, higher cost of capital, still trading at a higher multiple with a lower spread, how much bigger G? But that G has got to be on a positive spread. What's going on with Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman? Well, <clears throat> Lockheed Martin is trading at a discount to Northrop Grumman for a slightly different reason. They have pretty similar growths, 1.05 versus 0.94. They clearly have a lower spread at Northrop Grumman. 28 minus seven is about 21 points. 
Again, this is 57 points. So why is Northern Grumman trading at a higher multiple? Two reasons, slightly higher growth at the lower spread, but really for the PE, it's the lower hurdle rate, the 6.9% cost of it. What's going on with Northrop Grumman EV to EBIT? Why is this so much higher? Well, we already know that the lower hurdle rate, 6.2 versus 6.9 is affecting this. We know that they pretty much have very similar tax rates. So really it's the growth, 2.95 versus about one and a half. So G kind of plays a big role in both of these for why Northrop Grumman is trading at a premium to Lockheed Martin. They're just expected to grow faster. And in Northrop Grumman's case, grow faster with a little less risk. That's the lower WAC, that's the lower cost of equity. That's why Northrop Grumman is trading at almost 21 times EV to EBIT and Lockheed Martin is only trading at 15 times EV to EBIT. Whether the market is right or not doesn't matter. That's what the market currently believes. Questions about any of those analysis or what we just explained? <clears throat> Third multiple. Now you have to explain EV to sales. Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. Again, what's going to drive EV to sales more than anything else is going to be margin. And Lockheed Martin has a lower pre-tax margin than Raytheon, 12.9 versus 13.2. Now the after-tax margin is a little bit better at Lockheed Martin, 10.8 versus 10.2. But the pre-tax margin at Raytheon is a little bit better and EV to EBIT is based on pre-tax EBIT. So that is definitely helping Raytheon's EV to sales. They both have the same productivity, so that's not differentiating between the two. Tax rate's a little higher at Raytheon. So again, what's driving the EV to EBIT is the better operating margin at Raytheon. The other thing that drives that is the ROIC, and that's the other point. If they have similar productivities and similar margins, they're gonna have similar ROICs. So <clears throat> it's really the higher operating margin and to some degree, the growth of that margin is playing a role, but people are paying more EV to sales for Raytheon. Northrop Grumman has the lowest margin of the three, both operating as well as after tax. But they also have a lower productivity. So why is this EV to sales higher than Lockheed Martin if they make less than every dollar of sales and they had to reinvest 50% more? And the reason is because of the hurdle rate. So Northrop Grumman is getting a better EV to sales because of the less risk attributed to the margin. Lockheed Martin is not doing as well as Raytheon because of a little bit less pre-tax margin, even though it's less risky because Raytheon is expected to grow that much faster. Those are the three multiples. Why did my growth rate work for 18.74 for Raytheon even without changing the ROIC? What growth rate did, did you use? Where was asking me about that? 18.74, that is mathematically impossible. So that's another reason why it couldn't have worked, right? because the definition of a perpetuity is cash flow divided by R, which is the ROIC minus the G. In perpetuity, the G can never be higher than the ROIC. So if this number is 8%, G can't be higher than eight. So if you have an 18% G, that's invalid. So mathematically, in a perpetuity, G has to always be lower than R, than R okay? which is the same for key value drivers. So you can't have an 18% G in perpetuity if your cost of capital is less than 18%. It's another reason why it couldn't work. But good question. Let's get all these out. All right, other questions about any of this? How we did it, how we thought about it, 
what something means. Now's a good time to ask. So <clears throat> that's your assignment, that's your write-up. Let's now talk about what's coming. So homework 11. To some degree, doing the multiple analysis on companies like Costco, Walmart, Target, that's pretty easy because those companies, the past looks a lot like the future. They're very predictable. They don't change all that much. And so therefore the multiples are pretty easy to explain with the current data. This one required a little more thinking because Raytheon is an outlier <clears throat> where the current situation doesn't look anything like the future and we had to create the future, but Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman were not really in that situation. So it was really about just adjusting a little bit of Raytheon to get a more reasonable explanation. What if I gave you an assignment that was on the airline industry? which coincidentally, I just did. And what if in this assignment, you had to do like United and Delta and Southwest? And what if you saw here that for United, Delta and Southwest, that this is gonna be a little bit of a challenge because to explain those multiples as low as they are, what you're gonna see, you see return equity here, negative 35, 11, 38, 38. Like, what do I use for United Airlines return on equity into the future? As a matter of fact, if you go to here, I minimize the screen, I was in trouble getting it back. Go back to the EEO, scroll down to the bottom. You can actually go back some periods and add in more actual data. So we can see as an example that 2019 sales for United actually were 43 billion. 2020, their sales fell to 15 billion, then 24, and then this year expected to go back to 43. So this is the pandemic. It's true for all the airlines. Like when your revenue goes from 43 to 15 billion, nobody's gonna make any money doing that, right? And that's exactly what happened to the airlines. That's this big negative returns. Well, here's the problem. It gets even worse because we lost so much equity here with our losses that we wiped out our ROE. So even in 2022, we're going to have essentially no return in equity and we wiped out our equity. So we're going to get some really weird return in equities even on a go forward basis for the airline industry. So the point is, I know that the data today, 2021 data, using your RV, is not representative of the long term, not for any of these airlines, because they're still recovering from a pandemic. Because remember, anytime we do a multiple, we need to know what the companies look like in perpetuity, not what they look like today. Now, if today equals perpetuity, it's easier. Walmart, Target, Costco. If today doesn't look like perpetuity, airline industry, we have to create, kind of like we did for Raytheon, what it could be, right? So I'll give you a hint as to, to something you might consider doing. But if I were looking at United Airlines, FA. And I went to custom and I created a custom. One of the things I might do is to start typing in return on equity and return on invested capital. And I'm gonna switch this from six years to 10 years. But I might look historically <clears throat> and say, gee, pre-pandemic, what did the return on equity look like? Now, 2015 looks like an outlier year, but I get a sense that it was probably mid-20s. And what did ROIC look like? Well, it was probably low teens. <clears throat> so if I'm trying to assess for this industry when it returns to a more normal setting post-COVID, and I have a sense of what they were making, that might help also me determine an ROIC in perpetuity and an ROE in perpetuity that will help me when I try and estimate my Gs. So consider this a big hint on homework 11. Questions about any of that?
somebody says in the chat, could you just ignore or adjust the ROE? Exactly. Or use the forward three year. Exactly. But that's the point. You have to come up with something that helps explain what it's going to be in the future. And I'm giving you another way to potentially think about this. But this is not going to be an easy assignment because you're going to probably have to adjust all three lines. You're not going to be able to use Southwest, United, or Delta right out of the box. All right, let's take talk group case four. <clears throat> group case four is on Nokia. Now, Nokia is going to have one other thing that's going to be part of its multiples. When you go to Nokia and you type in RV and you're on, <clears throat> excuse me, a com source, best fit algorithm, <clears throat> it defaults to the whole firm. Okay. But if I go to custom and put in my operating ROIC template, Look at the spreads. Not only do I have to say, is the spread today the same as the spread in the future? Now with Nokia, we actually have a valuation that will help us with that. But when I click here from whole firm and I click on the drop down, I realize that Nokia has two businesses. All right, it's got an application software business. And sorry, my phone is ringing. I don't know how to stop it. Uh, it's got an application software business and it's got a communication equipment business. So I'm going to need to do the multiple analysis for each one of these two businesses. Now, I'll give you an example why. Like if I click on application software, I use global, these are their peers. There's a bunch of different peers globally. Let it load. But if I click on communication equipment, you'll notice two things. One, it's a completely different set of peers. And two, the operating ROIC is far different. It's a different industry. So Nokia is in two businesses. They have this very high return communication equipment business. And they got these very poorly returning application software business. And the peers for both those different businesses are different. Like in the hardware business, you have people like Juniper and Ericsson and Cisco, and you don't see those in the software side of the business, right? So <clears throat> when you do your multiple analysis, you're gonna have to do two multiples analysis. It's Nokia, same company, same multiples, but against the communication peers is gonna look different than Nokia against the software peers. So for next week's group case, what you're going to have to do is pick two companies off of each list and compare Nokia to them. So it's Nokia against communication. Now, I'm not going to tell you which two you have to pick. You can choose. Now, if I were your team, I would pick companies that probably I don't have to do a lot of normalization like we did with Raytheon or the airlines, if possible, or that are losing a lot of money. So like, I probably wouldn't pick interdigital. Second thing is when you do the software side of the house, the application software, same thing. I, I pick the easier to explain and identify two peers. So you're going to go EV2, EBIT, EV to sales or revenue, and PE, Nokia against both sets of peers with explanation and screenshots for everything for your PowerPoint presentation next week. That's everything that you're gonna to have to turn in. So again, if I'm on the software side, probably wouldn't pick Zoom. You could, you just have to do more adjustments for Zoom. Pick somebody like a Cerner, that might be easier, an Autodesk or Paycom, right? Again, I'll let you choose, but just giving you some suggestions, but you're gonna to have to pick two companies off of each list, Nokia against both, put in the screenshots, that's about five minutes, to cover all of the analysis for each one of those industry pairs. And that's what you're gonna to have to do for your next and final group case. Questions about any of that? Like we pick one, 
one company from uh, like each uh, business or two? Two, three total from each. Oh, so it's kind of like to uh, total six company? I don't know. Well, it's really five because it's Nokia five. against two application softwares, Nokia against two hardware. Now, if you want to do more than five, you're welcome to, but you have to do these as a minimum. And that's just going to complicate this assignment a little bit more. Other questions? All right, if no other questions, then as I said, later this week, Wednesday, no lecture. We're done with the lectures. So use that time during class on Wednesday to both one, do your individual homework 11, <clears throat> and two, start working, if you haven't already, as your teams on group case four, which will be presenting next Monday. On Wednesday, continue to work on the Bloomberg Trading Challenge. That's going to be finalized next week. Don't go into cash between now and then. Make sure you made the minimum amount of trades. And uh, if you need to do the assignment replacement, feel free to do that before next Monday as well. TAs will be having office hours later this week. So they're available to help you as you go through all of that. And then team six, <clears throat> uh, you need to stick around because we are going to talk after this class is over. And other than that, everybody have a good and safe week. And I look forward to seeing your presentations one week from today. Other than that, recordings is going to stop. And class is done. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.